We're going to study this evening one of Larry McMurtry's novels. McMurtry, most people know because of his movie successes and because of the very fine television show Lonesome Dove, which is now playing. And I've chosen leaving Cheyenne for this evening because of the voices you're going to hear. The voices of Molly Taylor and the various people who have come into, the, into her life. The 20th century has to be characterized as a century of individualism, individualistic action, and beginning with the voice of Kafka, moving into the voice of Stein's Ida, and then into Larry McMurtry. We'll conclude with John Weidman's voices, Bess, Clement, Big Bob, and Tommy. It's the voices we're trying to listen to, how people characterize themselves, and how the writers, in fact, characterize the people who are speaking and whom we should listen to. First, I'd like to review a few details of Larry McMurtry's background. His family, he tells us, in a book called In a Narrow Grave, comprised a history of cattle ranchers. His grandparents, Jefferson and Louisa McMurtry, moved to Archer County, Texas, in 1880. His father, William McMurtry, was one of nine sons, and presumably, according to accounts, they witnessed the last great cattle drive from the roof of a barn on Idiot Ridge in the late 1880s. McMurtry, in a narrow grave, talks about the stories that his family told him about these cattle drives and about Western life from 1880 on. It seems hard to realize that a lot of the characterization of the West as we know it, the Wild Bill Hickok shows, the Bill Cody extravaganzas, the last days of, or, or, or the last victories and the last fights of Geronimo, a lot of these events occurred not in the distant past of early American history, but in the 1880s, 1870s, 1880s, when the last resistance to the onset of uh, American culture was moving into and imposing itself upon the West. Larry McMurtry himself was born in Wichita Falls, Texas, in June 3rd, 1936. That's not very far off. You can probably buy your birthday cards now and send them to him. Tell him you enjoyed reading Leaving Cheyenne, which is by far not the first nor the last of the novels he has written or will have written. He's a prolific writer and very few people have really caught the spirit of the small town. Hmm? All right. We're trying to coordinate these. Very few people have caught the spirit of small town Texas life, particularly adolescent life, the way Larry McMurtry has done it. There are certain writers who catch the spirit of or the essence of their culture. Mahfouz, the Egyptian, gives us the slums of Egypt. Sinclair Lewis gives us small town, mid-America. Larry McMurtry gives us the adolescent and the nature of Texas life in the small town and probably does it better than anyone else. It's interesting, you may characterize him if you want, but don't let McMurtry hear you say it. You may characterize him a regional writer. He says, and he has been very outspoken about this, 
if he is a regional writer, then so is Daniel Defoe. So is Flaubert, who wrote Madame Bovary. So is Faulkner. So are all these writers, regional writers, who in fact have a universal audience. In fact, he says, all writers write about their regions. And so if you want to characterize any writer as regional, you could uh, perhaps characterize all writers as regional. The important thing and the, the characteristic of a writer of this skill is that he takes his locality and universalizes it. He makes people understand how the characters feel and helps us understand the real nature of the civilization we live in. That's not broadening it any more than we should broaden it. McMurtry himself in 1954 graduated with honors at Archer City High School. He was a four-year letterman in the band, a three-year letterman in basketball, a one-year letterman in baseball, a 4-H club officer for four years, not a 40-H club. They don't get that old, I don't think. And he wrote on the staff of the Cat's Claw, which either is a literary magazine or a newspaper. And I haven't had a chance to check on it. The 50s, of course, is the era that you see on television in uh, the Fonzie show. What's the name of it? The Happy Days. And... Uh, if you were in high school in the 50s, the chances are that one of the risque things you might have done is when the yearbook shot his photographs, you might have all raised your collars, you see. But the point is that uh, growing up in Texas, McMurtry had a feel of the small town. He decided to move to Houston for his baccalaureate career and started off at Rice University he wasn't too happy there. He said the people there were too highbrow, and he felt very uncomfortable. He said they were too intellectual for him, or at least acted too intellectually for him. Uh, John Weidman, who we're going to talk about next week, went from Pittsburgh to the University of Pennsylvania. He had somewhat of the same experience, except he was a seasoned basketball player. Uh, Perhaps McMurtry should have done it the way he did. Weidman simply said he stayed back and saw how other people behaved and then kind of blended in. We'll talk about that. But after one semester, McMurtry left Rice University and earned his bachelor's degree at North Texas, North Texas College, where he said he wrote 52 very bad short stories and then burned them. Now, it's very possible that a lot of people would have liked to have been able to write their short stories at the level at which stories were written that Larry McMurtry himself burned. But he had his way of doing that. It's very difficult sometimes to tell how good a story is when it's written early. And it's somewhat difficult to make judgments about these stories. I recently spent some time with a translator translating one of Nabokov's early short stories, a story called The Razor. It's a very interesting short story, and I'm not going to get into it. But after the translation was completed, we sent it to Roger Angel, the fiction editor of The New Yorker, thinking that he might like an early Nabokov story. It was written in 1924 when Nabokov was in exile from Russia in Germany, and it appeared in an exilic magazine. Uh, Angel wrote back that he thought it was a, uh, a youthful story by Nabokov and seemed somewhat amateurish. I thought it was better than that. At any rate, Nabokov's son has also translated the story himself, and it will be published in a future publication by Knopf, which is publishing all of the untranslated stories of Nabokov. So you have to be very careful. Ernest Hemingway's, a number of Ernest Hemingway's unpublished stories 
recently discovered, or several years ago, and uh, the general assessment is that they are better not published if you want to sustain his reputation. And today, what is today? April 25th, right? I better give the date so people who are watching this tape 50 years from now will know what I'm talking about. April 25th, 1995. I read where there is a meeting of a number of Nobel Prize winners in Atlanta, Georgia today, including the Japanese, the, the most recent winner, Oi, who says that if you really want to learn how to write, you should take someone's short story and rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it until you get the feel of the way he wrote and until you gather your own style and discover what your own style should be as you rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. So what do we discover that someone has written 52 short stories and destroyed them? Uh, we wonder what has disappeared. And it might have been better to have some of the stories still here to see the origin of some of the later novels, at least to see how style alters. We're going to have an opportunity today to look at some of McMurtry's pages from the archives of the University of Houston, where they now reside. And we'll look at the third, the opening chapter of the third part of Leaving Cheyenne to study the way his style has changed. Like the news broadcasts, I might save that for after the break so that you'll come back, you see, and see, and see the production. But it is the, the third book that we're going to look at. In 1959, uh, Larry McMurtry married Josephine Ballard and had one son. He has one son, James Lawrence. In 1960, he earned a master's degree from Rice University. And he was an instructor at Rice from 1960 to 1963. During that time, Horseman Pass By came out. HUD, which was made into a movie called HUD, featuring Paul Newman. And uh, Newman played HUD as the SOB he was. The story of how HUD was turned into a movie, McMurtry has written in this book of essays called In a Narrow Grave. He said one of the problems was that the young man playing Lonnie, I'm trying to think who it was, I think it may have been Brandon New Wild always wanted to run south to the brothels south of the border. Wasn't, could have devoted himself more to the quality of the movie. He says in In a Narrow Grave that in the scene where the cattle are being killed who have contracted anthrax, the director, well, essentially the story is that the movie reaches a culmination when a large large number of cattle, in fact all of the cattle on the farm, on the ranch, must be slaughtered to prevent the spread of anthrax. And a large pit is dug, the cattle are driven into the pit, and then they're shot. One of the things they wanted to do was to give this a realistic picture, and they wanted buzzards on the fence. And they caught some buzzards, but they couldn't get the buzzards to stay on the fence. At one point, they simply tied the buzzard's legs to the fence, and the buzzard simply fell over. So what they finally did was to shoot buzzards on a fence at long distance and superimpose the long and distance panorama on the initial scene to give you the impression of what was really happening. So it's an interesting book. But HUD, I think, HUD, by all extent and purposes, must be considered one of the classic movies, one of the, one of the fine movies made by Hollywood. That was in 1963. In 1963, when Hunter was released, uh, Leaving Cheyenne was published. Leaving Cheyenne, Hud 
and The Last Picture Show are the three novels by McMurtry characterized as the Thalia novels, a compact set of novels dealing with life in small, the small town. McMurtry suffered a divorce in 1965. Uh, some people might not use that term. Might have given him his liberty. I'm not sure how he would characterize that. He served as an instructor at Rice University in 1965, and in 1966 wrote The Last Picture Show, which was later followed by a sequel called Texasville. The Last Picture Show, the memorable, memorable characterization of Sam the Lion, the owner of the pool hall, being one of the formidable characterizations of uh, male bonding in uh, in literature. In 68 came a book that I've been telling you about in which he details some of his writing and some of his essays. One of the essays he... One, one of the essays discusses the nature of Houston itself. I may have mentioned this to you before, but I'll mention it again. He says there are two eyesores on the Houston landscape. One is the Shamrock Hotel in Texas, and the other is the Astrodome. He says they brag that one can fit the Shamrock Hotel in the Astrodome. He said that's a good idea, then you would only have one eyesore. I live in a, an area of Houston called Meyerland, and uh, McMurtry says, he can't wait to drive past the houses in Maryland that look the same and drive down to the barrio where he can enjoy the varied architecture which he characterizes as whorehouse architecture. So there is a distinction between Maryland and the barrio in his mind. He moved to Washington, D.C. in 1970, was the visiting professor at George Mason University, and then he has had a history of being attached to rare books and rare bookstores. He was he's co-owner of the Book Up Bookstore in Washington, D.C. In 1970 to 1971, he wrote a book called Moving On. And I'm not going to go on these books because I want to move into Leaving Cheyenne. All my friends are going to be strangers. All my friends are going to be strangers. In 1973, he wrote Leaving, uh, Leaving Cheyenne was released as a movie entitled Loving Molly. And there's a whole study. He's written a whole study of what went wrong with that movie. Among other things, the director did not understand what kind of town Thalia was and instead tried to shoot the movie in hill country. And so he distorted the entire lay of the land, uh, put the wrong characters in the wrong roles, and the movie uh, was a disaster. It still hasn't come out in video cassette, So that may be because he doesn't want it. Then Terms of Endearment in 1975 was translated into a top-rate top movie. Somebody's Darling in 78, and then a series of books that can only characterize uh, Larry McMurtry, if not writing as many books as Louis L'Amour, perhaps writing as many pages as Louis L'Amour because his books are more sizable. Cadillac Jack in 1982, The Desert Rose in 1983, Terms of Endearment in 1983 produced as a film, Lonesome Dove in 1985, Texasville, the sequel to The Last Picture Show in 1987, 1992 Evening Star, and uh, a year and a half ago, Streets of Laredo.
people have written books about McMurtry, but every time he keeps writing more, well, obviously you can write more. And those of you who are looking to write a senior thesis or a master's thesis could probably take the last eight books and see what is new in the developing style of Larry McMurtry. But tonight we're going to focus on leaving Cheyenne. I do want to just take a few moments to go over a bit of history during uh, McMurtry's lifetime. Let's just review these events so we know what events an author can conceivably deal with. And of course, the year of his birth, Germany moved into the Rhineland. When he was four years old, Trotsky was assassinated in Mexico. And when he was nine years old, World War II ended May 7th with the surrender of Germany and September 2nd with the official surrender of Japan. When he was 12, Gandhi was assassinated. The State of Israel was founded. Five years later, when he was 17, President Eisenhower became the head honcho of the United States. The first atomic submarine came in 1954, and Castro came to power in 1959. In 1961, one year after he entered Rice University, John Kennedy was inaugurated president. And when he was still a student at uh, North Texas State, Kennedy was assassinated. Got my other, all right. Let's look at that. Because he is not a political writer, none of these events appear in the novels. Uh, sometimes you'll find them, people like Mafuz, for example, will celebrate the year 1967. Uh, because of the Suez Canal invasions, but McMurtry doesn't get into modern politics. In 65, the civil rights movement was well underway. Martin Luther King and 2,600 blacks were arrested in Selma, Alabama. Richard Nixon was inaugurated president in 1969. The year after In On Arrow Grave appeared and three years after the last picture show. And then of course, most of you are familiar with events as they're developing. In 1981, Iran freed the 52 hostages held in Tehran since November 4. And we can look briefly to see what Larry McMurtry was doing in those years from the schedule I had provided. Cadillac Jack hadn't yet come out. In 1982, the British overcome Argentina in the Falklands War, something that probably doesn't concern us at all. But just to put McMurtry's background and McMurtry's uh, place in perspective. In 1985, 2,000 refugee Ethiopian Jews perished in the Sudan. The same year, Lonesome Dove was published. In 1986, one year later, 
the AIDS virus was identified. There are writers who deal with these problems. Uh, it's not to denigrate or to alter the importance of Larry McMurtry's work. But Edward Albee, of course, and the students who are writing plays in his workshops are very much involved in trying to discuss the trauma of the AIDS virus. And it's in 1989, two years after Texasville and four years after Lonesome Dove, Gorbachev was named the Soviet president. And we can keep going on past the elections of Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, President Bush, and President Clinton to point out all the events that conceivably have occurred while these works have been uh, issued. What a writer does, how he localizes, how he identifies his the matter he's most comfortable with is one of our concerns when we look at the book Leaving Cheyenne. Now when you look at the story of Leaving Cheyenne, you're dealing with certain basic characters. And let's look at some of the characters in Leaving Cheyenne and we'll identify them, spend some time with them. When Leaving Cheyenne came out in the first edition, McMurtry had published at the end of the book a uh, epitaphs to each of the characters giving us their exact uh, span of life. Now, one of the characteristics of Leaving Cheyenne is this, that the first part, the story that Gid tells in 24 chapters, for the most part, focuses on when these people are in their 20s. Molly's part, because she has now teenage sons who are going into the army, focuses on these characters in their 40s. And John Parson, the last part, focuses on the characters when they're in their 60s. So in effect, this book, Leaving Cheyenne, has antedated by many years Edward Albee's play, Three Women, in which a woman is characterized at each stage of her life as she grows older. So the technique is an interesting technique to use. It's not quite the technique we find in Maul Flanders, but Maul Flanders goes from youth to old age, but it isn't divided in these very, very succinct and manageable, rather unique and, and um, imaginative parts. All right, let's move on and look at these characters. The first set of characters, of course, are the main characters of the novel. See if I can focus this in some way. First, we have Mal, Mal Taylor, Molly Taylor, whose years are characterized from 1900 to 1976. Molly marries Eddie White. I don't have his dates there because that's not part of the epitaph. Johnny McLeod, the survivor who ends the novel as a survival. <clears throat> the novel ends with Johnny and Molly together. Johnny's years range from 1898 to 1985. So he lives to 88 years old. Molly lives to 76. Gideon lives from 1896 to 1962 and marries Mabel Perkins whom he obviously ought not to have married. There is not the happiest relationship and uh, 
Molly knows she could probably have had Gid, who's the one she favors. Of all, of all the figures, Eddie, of course, is abusive. That's the man her father most likes. Johnny is the one least likely to have ties. And uh, Gid is the one whom she probably should have married. But we can't speak in terms of should have or should not have because the novel is based upon what has happened. And we'll look at these characters. Molly bears two sons, none by Eddie White, but Joe is Johnny's son, and Jimmy is Gideon's son. And Mo Molly is quite happy when she knows that these are the men who are going to give her the children. She asks Gid to be with her. She tells Gid she wants her son, his son, and... Uh, Unfortunately, the sons are both killed in World War II. We'll get into that situation. And Molly is left at the end of the book with one survivor, and that, of course, is Johnny, without any, any heirs, without any children. The story of her children, as she tells it in her section, is, is as poignant as the stories can be, and certainly quite contemporary where uh, Larry McMurtry is trying to work out some very real problems that society still has yet to discover the answers for. So you have that Mull Taylor, 1900 to 1976, married to Eddie White, in love with Johnny, who gives her the son Joe, and Gideon, who gives her Jimmy, Gideon, of course, ma married to Mabel Perkins, born in poverty, and really never really quite able to get over it. She becomes possessive and acquisitive, and one of the characteristics of her poverty is her desire to hold on to everything she can get and to get everything that's coming to her. The, uh, the scene where Mabel is waiting for Gid to deliver the Montgomery Ward catalog, right? Montgomery Ward. Of course, he gets caught in a storm, doesn't deliver the catalog, and when he comes home, she wants him to go back instantly to find it. He certainly doesn't know where it is. She becomes, becomes irate with him. We'll talk about it. Goes into the basement and takes the preserves and starts her... her hurtling them about in the, uh, the basement of their home. And when Gid finally comes down and finds her unconscious asleep, he, he has to clean up this terrible mess. Uh, he can't imagine anyone purposely wanting to destroy fine preserves. <laughs> but that's what he has to come home to. And... Uh, on some occasions, he decides not to come home because he knows what's waiting for him, what this termagant has waiting in store for him, and the unhappiness that she brings. Of course, we know that at the end of the novel, when Gid dies, not only does the family and, and her brother-in-law, Willie Peters, assert themselves, they move Johnny off the property, and... Uh, the separation is really quite complete from Molly and from everybody else. To the extent that the novel ends in this very, very harsh, or ends with this harsh reality and this mean-spirited reality, it, uh, it's not as sociable, it's not as warm, it's not as... Uh, A loving piece of art, as you might have, as you might want. To this extent, the novel is very good. It ends with a point of reality, that with all the loving that Molly has, with all the joy that Johnny has given, and with all the pleasure that Gid has 
had with Molly and with his relationship. There is incorporated his own family or his family circumstances, a situation that can identify with it. And perhaps that's one of the things that McMurtry was really doing in that section by introducing Willie at the end. What he was trying to demonstrate is that this unique relationship between Molly, Gid, and Johnny is something so discreet in its characteristics, so particular in its associations, and so intimate in its vocalizations, that no one from the outside could really penetrate it. And therefore, leading Cheyenne in this contrast of spirit at the end of the novel gives us perhaps all too transparently a contrast between the real world as it exists and this romantic world uh, that Molly inhabits with her lovers. A world which incidentally has a unique situation in which we have both Gid and Johnny who are friends writing letters to each other. One hardly imagines that they would be characteristic or, or, or be figures whom one would see as being figures in an epistolary novel. But we'll look at their letters. They're somewhat intelligible, but not entirely uh, informative. Now, let's look at some of the characters and see see what's happening. One of the things I'd like to do tonight, some of you have, I mean, most of you have read this novel, and you may want to give us some idea of your own impressions of these characters. The novel is the kind of novel that you can get into fairly easily, that you want to spend time with. And it's a shifting novel that is unlike the red and the black, where developmental well it gives developmental chapters. McMurtry gives us spurts of information. You have chapters that are sometimes two and three pages long, and sometimes twelve pages long. Sometimes one chapter is a half a page long. And so you, you see a character developing not by virtue of long protracted episodes, but of almost memorials. And since these characters are each telling the story, they're not necessarily going to linger long on particular episodes that a narrative style and an author in which the narrative style progresses, uh, progresses uh, from the beginning of an event to the end of an event would do. In, in fact, in this particular set of situations, where you have 24 parts in chapter 1 in Gid's description, uh, 9 in Molly's section and 9 in Johnny's, have an odd distribution. Gid sets, Gid's episode sets up everything. Molly gives us the poignancy of her relationships with her sons. And the voice changes in the last book by Johnny to two old men, old men, 60 years old, who are a, uh, moving on in their lives, but feeling very old and feeling very tired, having illnesses and get with, with a... Uh, with his uh, malignant malignancy, we see characters who are dying. The question is how to keep these dying figures alive, how to give them energy, how to see them moving along. And how this happens in the last book is part of the animation of McMur McMurtry style where the remembrance of things past animates the events that are occurring, gives new energy to tired people 
and reinvigorates their own desire until, of course, in the very last chapter, uh, we find Johnny invigorated to his delight and to a uh, Molly's delight. Let's first of all look at Gideon Fry, the son of a rancher. Gideon is the fellow with responsibilities. His father wants him to marry late, he says, before you get all your foolishness out. But because you're so stupid, you probably will marry early anyway. Probably set up the wrong arrangement, probably make the wrong decisions. But nevertheless, think about it. And even much later, when Gideon is concerned about some decisions that he has to make about the land. He wishes his father were around. As harsh as his father was, he nevertheless gives advice that one expects from the father in order to manage the land. Gideon and Johnny are given the responsibility early, uh, early of taking a large number of horses to Fort Worth for sale a large number of cattle to Fort Worth to sail. And Gideon runs into a meat packer who gives him 10 cents on the pound. He brings in $8,000. Filled with the euphoria, filled with the euphoria of this experience, having all this money Gid feels that he can pyramid it into greater profit. Only to discover that he has looked at a herd of cattle, not into the eyes and at the hoofs, but from above, strikes a deal with a dealer and finds out that he has made the wrong deal, has lost a good sum of money, almost $1,200. And finally, in an episode we'll look at a little later, has to sell the cattle back to the man who bought it from him. And he suffers a loss. He says he, he wishes he could get back at the fellow who tricked him into buying these seed cattle with mangy characteristics, roomy eyes, and split hoofs. But he realizes that he bought the cattle square and fair, uh, uh, fair and square and it's only his own stupid dealings that will cause him the losses. When he returns home, suffering the losses, his father doesn't seem to react. McMurtry may know something more than I do, but his father may have simply assumed that his stupid son would have lost something rather than gained it all. I guess the equation might be today where a teenager gets his driver's license and smashes up the right side of the car the first time he goes out in it. And since we know everyone has to at least have one accident to realize how serious a, a problem driving is, he may have thought that this was Gid's experience and coming off, it, coming off it worse for the wear only meant he would be a better rancher thereafter. Git, of course, throughout the novel is given this sense, this profound sense of the land. His father has built the land. His father has worked the land. His father takes him out to survey the land. And when his father commits suicide, feeling he's too old to go on, Gid knows exactly where he's going to find his father on a hill looking over his land. Gid, perhaps, is the youngster who, whom Molly most loves. She enjoys being with Gid and with Johnny. Goes with Eddie White more as in spite than not. And Gid is the person who has a conscience. 
Molly says that Gid has made love to her many, many times, but perhaps not more than three or four or four or five times has he ever left her not feeling guilty about this relationship, particularly after he's married. And he stays with Molly as long until the death of Jimmy. And the death of Jimmy leaves him conscience-stricken so that he, uh, for almost a ten-year period, spends no time with Molly. Molly always willing to be with Gid, really the one she would like to marry. She should have, she perhaps should have married. And even at the end of the novel, we discover that Molly is a lusty figure, a lively figure, a lovely figure, because she tells Johnny, you can come every night and stay the entire night as long as you wish. We'll look at Molly in a few moments. Gid is also very generous to his friend Johnny McLeod because he buys a silver saddle for Johnny, polishes it, hides it from his dead father, but polishes and cleans it. His father finally catches him doing this. And the loyalty between Gid and Johnny from the very beginning is classic. Can you think of, I guess, the the loyalty of uh, David and Jonathan in the Bible may be equated to some extent with this. Someone should write an article about that, you see, how these, these loyalties stay together. Johnny McLeod, same age as Gideon, but Johnny comes from a poor family. His father had some wealth, some land, and at the end his father still leaves him. He still has two tracts of land that his father left him, although the house is somewhat ramshackle. In addition to the thousand acres of land that Gideon gives him, Johnny still has his father's ranch, a ranch which when broke, as he tells us, when his father bought extra wheat, only dis discovered that a hailstorm uh, cleaned them out. Johnny McLeod loves his horses and his saddles, but he makes a clear distinction that he is a rancher and not an oat picker. I mean, he's a rancher and not a cowboy, excuse me. He'll go cowboying. He will work a ranch even though he's not even as skillful a rancher as Gideon. Gideon could break 18 horses in a day, 18 broncos in a day. He's, he's not as good as Gideon, but he knows how to work a farm, and he knows how to give, put in a day's work. And Gideon even mentions how good it is to work with Johnny because you get things done. Eddie White, the field warrior, field worker, will spend a little bit of time with that. Uh, Eddie is a roustabout, marries uh, Molly, and then discovers enough that after the first child, he distances himself from Molly, and after the second child, he has nothing more to do with Molly sexually, and then he himself is killed falling off an oil derrick, which moves him out of the path of these two who are going to spend the rest of their lives with Molly. Eddie White drinks liquor, enjoys drinking liquor with Molly's father, who is himself probably as mean-spirited and as a, uh, disinterested in Molly as Eddie might be at some point. Now, who is Molly Taylor? Let's look at Molly for a while. We'll eventually get into it when we start discussing the parts of the novel. Larry McMurtry has done something interesting. He has begun Molly's division with a quote from Geoffrey Chaucer. And I'd like to put that on the screen and let's see what it 
what it says because we'll we'll use Molly and and take our clue from Larry McMurtry to see what Molly is really like. Actually, the passage begins the section on Johnny, but let's look at the quotation from Chaucer. Those of you who have the book, it's on page 191. It reads like this. <clears throat> now remember the wife of Bath is characterized by the fact that she is lusty, that she has five husbands, that she's put four of them in the grave. One of them she has a terrible fight with. He throws a book at her and deafens her ear. But she's the one who says that uh, God has given us what we possess. And we ought to use it with as much fervor and as much joy as anyone can, can use. And here she has this phrase from the Canterbury Tales, the passage, The Wife of Bath. Upon me youth, and on me jolly tay, it tickleth me about a main heart a rot. Unto this day it doth mine heart but did he have had my world as in me to him. But as alas, that all wool in venny me hath me be rough, me bote in me under me pith. Let go, farewell. The devil go there with. The floor is gone. There is no more to tell. The brown is ibas can. No, must he sell. What's she saying there? But Lord Christ, when you remember me, my youth and my pleasure, I'm just tickled to my heart's content. And to this day, I've enjoyed everything I've done. It doth mine heart the good. It doth mine heart but that I've had my world and my time. I've had my love. I've had my pleasure. I've had my joy. But age, alas, that poisons me. That all will envenom me. Age will poison me. It hath taken away my beauty and my lust. Ah, let go, farewell. The devil goes therewith, that's all that's worth. She says, the flower is gone, my bloom is no more. And there's no more to tell. Instead of selling what I can sell, instead of making love with the joy I have, she says, the chaff, the bren, as I best know, is all that I can sell. Now, in terms of what this book offers, what this passage offers, this passage, the wife of Bath tells us, before she meets her fourth husband. So she has a lot of gusto left. And to the extent that she laments the fact that she no longer has this verve and this energy, and now wants to bring it back. The last book of Leaving Cheyenne, when Johnny finds himself in bed with Molly after the death of Gid, and he found, finds that he is capable of making love, it gives us again the wife of Bath. She claims that she's too old, but she is lusty enough that she can still enjoy life. And so the decision to put 
uh, to equate the wife of Bath with Maul is not so distant a, uh, a comparison as one might have. All right, let's look at some of these other characters. Adam Fry, Gideon's father, independent, a rancher, a tough guy, capable of dealing with his son. Are we... We've had trouble communicating with West Houston or North Houston. I don't know if they can come in yet today. Mr. Keach, are you still there? He's called me three times now to say that he is there. And uh, maybe the communication is down. Cletus Taylor, Molly's father, mean-spirited and drunken. passage in which he teaches one of his sons sex by asking Molly to undress and show him her passions is a uh, one of the moments in literature that comes out of the imagination of a writer and that uh, may not be so far from the truth when you pick up the newspapers and read what's, what does happen and the the uh, extent to which incest and abuse may characterize a person's home. Molly, in fact, at one point is pummeled by her father and suffers a black eye and can't go to dance, dance with the boys. And is it the uh, Johnny or, or Gid who stays with her all night? He's supposed to take her to the dance and he decides that She's not in a condition, so he stays with her. How does Cletus Taylor die? All right, we need the microphones on. Press the button so we have it. Oh, he drinks lye. Thinking it's liquor, and of course, uh, he uh, dies this terrible, terrible death. No one, I think, regrets his death. <laughs> Mabel Peters, Gideon's wife, a poor man. Later on, Gid says that he should have known something when he saw all these youngsters come running his way from her family. Without clothing, without good clothing, just threadbare garb when she marries him, she quickly learns how to spend a great deal of his money and how to uh, make his life miserable for him. And they don't have any children themselves. Their sons, Gid and Molly's son, Jimmy, is a religious zealot. And when he is told who his father is, and he realizes that his mother is still with these men, he calls her a harlot, hurts her, hurts her, and she becomes a poignant character at that point. And he goes off to war identifies through letters to her that he has become a homosexual or that he has, that he is homosexual. It's not something one becomes, I think, in a lot of cases, in most cases, and probably in all cases. But a letter comes to her telling her that Jimmy has been killed in the Pacific Theater. I understand. He, he wasn't killed. He just said that, you know, she could tell anybody, you know, whatever they wanted to, but from what I, he does die? 
Okay, I just thought that he was going to go live with a rich man out in, you know, California. Yeah, if you have something to add to, please press, press the button and be part of the discussion. Right. There's, there's a passage where Molly goes to the post office and she gets a, a letter. Apparently, I mean, it, it doesn't say it's from the State Department, but that's who it, it, it would be from. Um, and she, it, the way it's written, it's written from her perspective, it's as if she goes into some kind of a, a shock everything slows down, she's not completely aware of who's around her, what's happening, uh, where she is, um, and then she goes and finds Git. Johnny, the second, uh, Joe, the second son, Johnny, Molly's son, a fun-loving youngster, is also killed in an air raid over Germany during World War II. I picked up the newspaper today and read that a number of airmen were killed in a helicopter. And one has to understand that if you put on a uniform, you're going to enter hazardous duty in peacetime and in war. And so it isn't necessarily surprise, but to the extent that Molly has suffered the loss of two youngsters, two of her children, she would in World War II be characterized as a gold star mother and would be hanging flags in her windows with these flags designated that one of her sons or that both the two of her sons had been killed. Pardon me? All right, let's go to page 176 and look at that. Miss Harris has given that to us. <clears throat> yeah. I stopped in the drugstore a minute and drank a 400, she says, she's in town, and then went to the post office. My good housekeeping had come, and the New Reader's Digest, and the rest of the box was full of sales circulars of one kind and another. When I pulled all them out, the letter dropped on the floor. I threw all the circulars in a wastebasket before I picked it up. Then I went over to the counter and opened it and read it, and my mouth felt dry. It felt like my lips were chapped. People kept going by me to get their mail. I don't know who, they were just like shadows. Finally, old man Bordeaux, the postmaster, came out and tacked some kind of notice on the bulletin board, and then he came over to me and offered me his handkerchief. I didn't think I was crying, but I was. I'm mighty sorry, Mrs. White, he said. I guess... They're going to get all the boys before it's over. It was a month before I remembered to give him back his handkerchief. I walked out and started to look for Gid. I knew he had built a new house on the west side of town, on what they called Silk Stocking Avenue. He said they ought to call it Mortgage Row. People in cars kept stopping and offering me rides. I don't know what I said to them. I knew the house by Gid's car setting in front of it. Then I seen him way at the back digging post holes. He was putting up some kind of pen. He looked so surprised when I came running up to him. I put my face against his chest so I couldn't see anything. I could smell the starch on his shirt and the sweat under his arms when he put them around me. They killed my last old boy, I said. Molly, would you like to go in? I looked at his house a minute. It was a big, ugly brick house. Let's go home, I said. He took me into his car and put me in the front seat. And then they stop at the post office and go, go to their house. 
Well, I mean, but didn't she later on, you know, look at the letter and and it's it's from him? And you know, I mean, you know, from from what I from what I interpreted is that he wasn't killed in the war, but he he was dead to her, and so she used that to say, you know, to use that as, a, as an excuse because uh, her son was gone from her. Well. Um. If you, you know, if you interpret it that way, uh, it may be more wishful thinking. I mean, she says, she, she says, and, and we may we may find a different interpretation. But I, I would take this at face value. And what characterizes the work is it's real, and there are no hysterics. She has good sense. She goes looking for Gid. You may you may think. That, that isn't good sense, but and it's all underplayed. Uh, Larry McMurtry knows how to deal with a scene of passion. She sees people going past her, but they've become a glaze. She doesn't recognize them. Just moments of reaction give us a very poignant moment, and, and the way scenes of this sort might well occur. Yes. Um, I think on the top of 178, though, it explains the other letter. When they're playing dominoes, she explains that uh, she had another letter that Gid had asked her to see, and she had hidden it in a shoebox, and that's the letter. Well, that's the letter that identified what he felt like. Right, they never she wanted to burned, see that he said he was gay and then he wasn't didn't want to see her anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Those look like two different letters. But it is kind of weird. This but she is. also no, says she, she on on 177 that mm -hmm. um that she was she felt bad about um Jimmy losing his life and never getting to have it. I mean I think that you know, she wouldn't say, I don't think she would say that as she thought that he, or she was still thinking, oh, he's still alive, because I don't think she would reduce him, you know, to, you know, just because he was homosexual. Well, th there never was a chance. He had rejected her because he was a religious fanatic. Right. He had become a religious fanatic. He had condemned her. And then when he went off and discovered his own identity, uh, there was no turning back. There, there was no attempt of reconciliation. And by the way, in the one of the lessons we learned from the 60s, well, of course, this is World War II, but one of the lessons that was learned in the 60s was that instead of rejecting people, people have to learn to get along with them. Now, one of the things I want to do and as we can go, we're going to go into some other characters too. But in a few moments, we're going to stop for a break. And right after the break, I'm going to, we're going to do two things. The first thing I'm going to do is look at Larry McMurtry's style in rewriting the first, the, the third, the beginning chapter of the third part. We're going to look at the style. Because I have some pages that were graciously given to us by the special collections room of the library, which holds the leading Cheyenne manuscript. And Larry McMurtry himself gave, he's the only one who will give permission to do this. He gave us permission to look at these pages. And what I want to do is look at the pages and see what appears on the page and what changes McMurtry made so we can see his style. I've already suggested to you in a number of situations that he knows how to underplay emotion because he knows he's dealing with real, real human reactions. By the way, the same is true in movies. You can look at movies 40 years ago and see how emotions are handled and realize that today they're being underplayed. But I do want to show you before the break one uh, piece of information we have, and those are Larry McMurtry's notebooks. He's also given us permission to use the, to look at these, and these are the notebooks for 
uh, leaving Cheyenne. So let's look at these, and you'll see McMurtry's handwriting. This is the outline for leaving Cheyenne. This is the page, leaving Cheyenne, my foot's in the stirrup or the blood's country. He hadn't yet decided what he's going to call the section. What did he call it? Blood's country. In the last part, he's deciding whether he should call it my pony won't stand. He says it definitely is going to be Johnny's point of view. He's already decided that. Or he's going to title it, Go Set My Horses Free. Now let's look at his notepad. This is where he is working on it. Now, I'm not sure whether this is an outline. I mean, it is an outline of major movements in the in Gid section, Blood's Country. I'm not sure whether July, early in July, July, or when he's supposed to write these, or when he's supposed to review these. We have some indication one way. Oh. Oh, these, these are the datings, right. Okay. Because he has... He has later on, oh, this page in the notebook is leaving Cheyenne when he's doing the revisions. January 29th, he's doing 15 pages. And in his day book, he has 11 pages. January 30th, he's reviewing 46 pages. In his day book, it's 35. Right. These, are the, these are the dates on which, from January 29th to February 5th, which is a pretty fast review. He's reviewing some of these pages. All right, and you're right. The, the dating is here. So let's look. This is his summary, Gid's section. His dad wakes him up, seen with a saddle, the schoolhouse scene, that's the election scene. Chapter 2 is the fight in the hayfield, which ends with Gid giving away the saddle. The third, while Johnny's in the pan panhandle, Gid's arguing with his father when he decides he's just going to join Johnny. And then the fishing scene with Molly. That's the scene where Molly tells Gid she wants to go swimming with him, and he's really embarrassed that she wants to go skinny dipping, uh, which gives us our first clue that Gid is moralistic, somewhat shy. He has a conscience. Johnny wouldn't have hesitated at all. So you do get the distinction between Gid and Johnny, and you get to see uh, Larry McMurtry's handwriting. Well, let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to look at some pages closely that Larry McMurtry has allowed us to examine. And then we're also going to have a lecturer, one of the, Ms. Amy Harris, wrote a paper on a comparison between Moll Flanders and Molly. And I thought it's a very original and interesting statement. I thought she could spend a few moments reading parts of her paper to you and uh, give you some relief from my own commentary. Let's take a break. <laughs>